you have um, 21 year old lady married 3 months back presenting with history of urinary frequency how are you going to proceed so i will assess the patient uh, history um, regarding um, uh, the severity of the uh, frequency whether associated with any uh, urgency or nocturia any incontinence associated with that is there any difficulty in emptying the bladder any voiding symptoms i will ask about um, any dysuria or discharge um, ask about any red flag symptoms like hematuria recurrent uti or any palpable uh, masses uh, i will ask also uh, about uh, any triggering factor uh, for her uh, symptoms anything in the food or drink she notices which uh, precipitate the uh, um, frequency um, also i will ask about her uh, uh, medical history any history of uh, diabetes or neurological disease any use of medication I will ask about her past surgical uh, history and neurological procedure uh, before, uh, and I will ask about whether she had any previous pregnancies and any childbirth and any use of any uh, assisted uh, delivery. Um, I will ask about social history, the use of um, um, any illicit drug, the smoking, and the impact of her symptoms in her life um, and sexual life. Um, and then I'll proceed to examination of the uh, patient. Uh, uh, I'll examine uh, general examination, including the uh, BMI. I will assess uh, the patient abdomen, looking for any type of muscle tenderness, and I will examine the genitalia, both in supine and uh, left lateral position, with the help of some uh, speculum. I will uh, get uh, urine dip stick to assess for any infection, uh, blood, uh, glucose, or protein. I will send the sample for culture if there is any infection, and I will ask the patient to uh, fill a validated questionnaire, which is ICIQ um, uh, F uh, LUTs, and uh, I will uh, ask the patient also to perform a flow rate and the bladder scan uh, since she is in the clinic. Could you explain ICIQ for LUTs? So this is a validated questionnaire by the International Continence. And, um, international consultation on incontinence um, uh, society uh, concentrating on the uh, laurian tract symptoms specifically in females so it is different from the ipss which is mainly designed for uh, the male and it contain um, uh, i think about 13 question okay um, do you know anything like uh, severity how will you quantify a patient got severe or mild moderate um, I'm not quite sure, but the ICIQ, they have a, a separate bladder score for each urinary symptoms, um, not like the IPSS, which has a, a, a bladder score for all the symptoms at the end. Okay. Um, this patient has got quite bothersome symptoms. Her main problem is frequency of urination, no signs of any incontinence, married for three months, no specific problems with sexual history, no past history of any obstetrics. Her menstrual cycle is regular, no history of any medication intake, social life, she's not a smoker and uh, no increased intake of alcohol or no history of any drug intake. Examination wise, she is thin built. Her BMI is only 24 with uh, examination being normal. How are you going to proceed? So in this patient, uh, I'll assume that uh, her frequency may be an element of uh, overactive uh, bladder symptoms. Um, so I will ask. Uh, by, I will start by conservative therapy, by asking the patient uh, try to avoid any fluid or food which uh, trigger her symptoms. Um, pelvic floor exercise and the bladder uh, training, uh, as recommended by EAU, for at least um, um, six uh, weeks may be helpful uh, for the patient. Uh, and then I will review the patient uh, again in three months' time. If she's still uh, symptomatic, then I will start the medical treatment. Okay. Um, you are advising the lifestyle changes. She is trying to diligently follow it, but uh, not much improvement, only minor improvement. And she also developed urgency, sensation, and um, she's quite bothersome. 
Okay, so uh, I will start then with the uh, medical uh, treatment in the form of anticholinergic uh, medication. Um, so I will prescribe her. Uh, I will start her on uh, anticholinergic medication with the lowest uh, acquisition cost according to the uh, NICE uh, recommendation. I will explain to the patient that she needs to use the medication for at least four weeks to have the maximum uh, benefit. I will explain about the possible side effect, including dry mouth, constipation, uh, blurred uh, vision, and I'll make sure that the patient has no contraindication for anticholinergic. So what type of anticholinergic, what dose you're starting? Um, I will usually in my practice, I prefer, um, I know that uh, oxybutynin and tolterodine are uh, the cheapest. Uh, however, in my practice, usually I start with solifenesin. Uh, five milligram uh, once daily since it is um, um, a selective one and uh, has a, a good clinical result. So I will start on solifenesin five milligram once daily, uh, reviewed by the GP in four weeks. Uh, if there is a partial response, then he can increase the dose further to 10 milligram. How will you explain the side effects of solifenesin? The main side effect is uh, dryness of the mouth, uh, constipation, uh, uh, blurred uh, vision uh, and palpitation. So these are the main things. Okay, why that side effects happens? It's mainly because uh, solifenesin acts mainly on uh, M2, M3 receptors in the bladder. However, it may affect other muscarinic receptor in the body, so causing these symptoms. Okay, um, you are seeing her in three months' time. She had increase in the dose of solifenesin to ten milligrams by the GP. She is quite troubled by the side effects of constipation and dry mouth. She needs to discontinue the tablet and she is back to square one with symptoms. Yeah, unfortunately, this is not uncommon because of the side effect profile of the anticholinergic. A lot of patients, they drop the treatment. Um, so in this case, I will counsel the patient about the use of uh, uh, mirapiclone, which is a beta-3 adrenal receptor agonist. So what is beta-3, how it works? So basically, it is uh, uh, adrenal receptor uh, agonist act on the beta-3 receptor, which is supposed to um, uh, relax the uh, detrusal muscle. So it decreases the, sens uh, decrease the sensitivity of the detrusal muscle to um, calcium. Therefore, it causes uh, detrusal muscle uh, relaxation um, without affecting, so it will increase the capacity without affecting the contractility of the the trusal muscle, unlike the anticholinergic medication, which will affect the contractility. Okay. How are you going to explain the side effects? So for mirabigron, uh, the main thing I want to make sure that the patient is uh, not known to be hypertensive, and I will check her blood pressure since the main concern is um, um, uh, uncontrolled uh, blood pressure. Um, uh, any patient with a blood pressure systolic more than 180 or diastolic more than 110 millimeter mercury should be excluded from Um I will check her blood pressure before starting the treatment and then I will follow the blood pressure regularly through the GP to make sure that Merabigron is not affecting her uh, blood pressure. The other um, rare side effect of Merabigron is a little bit increase in the rate of uh, urinary tract infection and it may cause uh, palpitation as well um, in, in some patient. Um, I am aware of a new uh, version of uh, beta-3 adrenal receptor, which is uh, Vibigron, um, medication 75 milligram, which is uh, used and approved in the US. And this one is not associated with uh, hypertension, but it's still not approved in the UK. Good. She responded well to Mirapigron and you have discharged her. She presented after two years with uh, recurrence of symptoms uh, in spite of taking the tablets. How are you going to evaluate? I will reassess the patient uh, again by having a, a complete history examination um, as a validated uh, questionnaire, um, urine analysis, uh, uh, fluorite and uh, uh, blood and scan. And if the uh, symptoms are similar to the previous one, I will just uh, restart the uh, Mirabigron again for the patient. Uh, she is taking Mirabigron regularly, but in spite of Mirabigron, she has got the recurrence of symptoms. Sorry. So she was using the Mirabigron for the last two years, but in spite of that, she still has some symptoms. Yeah.
Yeah, so according to the European um, guidelines, uh, EAU guidelines, uh, we can uh, combine mirabigron with anticholinergic medication uh, in order to get uh, the maximum symptomatic improvement. And this is supported uh, uh, by the Synergy 2 study, which showed uh, safety and efficacy of sulfonylacin uh, 5 milligram and mirabigron, which was used for more than 12 months. Oh, she remembers the solifinacin side effects of dry mouth and constipation. She is not interested in that. Okay. So, and, and she can, we can try another anticholinergic medication, which may have a little bit, some difficult, uh, some different side effect. However, if she is not keen to try the anticholinergic at all, um, then I will discuss with the patient that, um, since Mirabigron uh, alone is not enough to control her symptoms, then we may need to move to a uh, more invasive treatment for her uh, overactive bladder. So what are you going to do? So in this case, uh, the next step is to consider intravesical Botox injection. I will arrange for the patient to have a, a urodynamic study uh, before to see whether there is any detrusal over activity or not. I will discuss her case in the uh, local urogynecology MDT, and then I will counsel her about the use of uh, intravesical uh, Botox. And I will explain uh, mainly about the need to use, to learn how to do self-intermittent uh, catheterization uh, and about the other um, side effect of uh, Botox therapy. Okay, uh, are you able to see the screen? Can you explain the tracings? Yes, so this is um, a urodynamic study of a patient uh, which uh, showed, so the top one is the trusal, basal, and abdominal. Okay, which showed uh, some uh, detrusal over activity, uh, very obvious, reaching up to around 60 centimeter uh, water. And also, I think that the bottom one is not a clear, but I think this is the flow. So um, some of these um, uh, bladder overactivity associated with some uh, urine leak as well. Yes. Which, which goes with uh, um, detrusal overactivity. I will check from the history of the patient to see whether she had any neurological disease. Then it will be a neuropathic detrusal uh, overactivity. Otherwise, uh, it should be regarded as idiopathic detrusal overactivity. Okay, there is no neurological problems for her. How will you differentiate between detrusal overactivity and uh, leak due to abdominal straining? Uh, in the in the leak due to abdominal straining, there will be rise in the uh, abdominal pressure as well, which is not the case here. So the uh, abdominal um, line is, is almost stable, while the rise is mainly in the vasculature and the trusa. So these are um, uh, genuine detrusal contractions. Okay, so what are we going to do for her? So for this patient, there is a proven detrusal overactivity, which uh, uh, an obvious indication to go ahead with the intravesical Botox uh, injection. So I explained to her that the procedure uh, can be done under general anesthesia or local anesthesia, and we will inject uh, about 20 sites all over uh, the bladder with the Botox. Uh, the expected side effect in most of the patient that there will be some dysuria and hematuria for a few days after the procedure. There is incidence of UTI about um, uh, 10%. Uh, there is a possibility of urine uh, retention, uh, which is about 6% uh, for each 100 international uh, units. And the patient need to be uh, confident in using self-intermittent catheterization uh, before we start the treatment. I'll explain that the effect of Botox will wear off within six to nine months, and we may need to repeat uh, the dose again. Okay, what are the, why you want to do the intermittent self-catheterization? Um, sorry? Why intermittent self-catheterization before Botox? Uh, because the patient may develop uh, urine retention and uh, she needs to uh, be confident in doing self-intermittent catheterization before we start. If she is not willing or unable to do the self-intermittent catheterization, uh, then I will not consider uh, Botox for this patient. Okay. Well done. It's time now. We have slightly overshooted to 11 or 12 minutes because I just want to bring out the Botox also in the discussion. Again, well done. No major concerns. Uh, uh, 
one thing which I can advise is all these patients, whether it's a male AUTS or female AUTS, try to bring in body mass index while examination. It's a good habit to mention the BMI rather than just mentioning the weight alone. Um, you have missed to bring in chaperone during the third scenario. I, I mean, it's quite common and I don't think the examiner will be able to pick like how I picking you. But uh, just be careful and then because for the examiner, you are just discussing only one scenario. Okay. For me, yeah. I know you very well. This has just happened by oversight. And um, as per the NICE guidelines, you are advising the patient lifestyle changes first and reviewing again. If you see the NICE guidelines, it is mainly designed from the GP practice level, of course for the super specialities also. So for the GP practice, it's always nice to tell them some reversible lifestyle changes and new lifestyle changes and then uh, unnecessarily not starting on a medication. But these things should have been done at the GP practice level, at the expectation, even though in real life it may not happen. So it is better for you as a specialist to start the medication in the first visit itself. The same thing applies even for the male LUTS table. Uh, because uh, even though you can advise lifestyle changes, uh, it will patient will lose a precious one or two months and the presence of symptoms. So it's nice to start the medications. You can tell the patient that you will need these medicines, but try life changes for at least maybe a few weeks. If you're not improving, go to the GP and start the medicines. Rather than giving only life changes, seeing a patient in three months time and advising medicines from the second visit. Point. Thank you. Okay, you can bring in nice guidelines and you can say as per the nice guidelines, I wish to do that. I hope the GP may have advice lifestyle changes because that's expectation. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's Good. Fine. We will complete today's session with these three scenarios. Any questions you have in these? Uh, no, actually, these are quite uh, good uh, scenarios, but uh, uh, can we do some like uh, urinary incontinence? Uh, later on maybe yeah that's the plan so we will do one more female urology session with uh, uti uh, postmenopausal uti and uh, second thing something like uh, vesicovaginal fistula and then we will do stress urinary incontinence as a three scenarios very good yeah that's will complete most of the topic thank you very much very good thanks for joining uh, wishing you a good day Hopefully, close to the exam, we can do much more frequent scenarios and we'll make sure we'll complete the whole syllabus at least twice before you guys go for exam. Yeah, thank you very much. Really appreciate you. Thank, thank you. Have a nice day. For you as well. Thank you. Bye.